You are listening to Live from Lloyd North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. The advance of AI and robotics bring many challenges, as well as huge opportunities, and public concern about changes in the labor market have been mounting in recent years. But is our pessimism justified? Could we be viewing the AI debate in the wrong way? Today we're joined by Len Shackleton, the IEA's editorial fellow and author of a recent report into robotics and the future of work. Interviewed by Digital Officer Madeline Grant, Len examines whether we might be overstating our predictions of widespread job loss. They also evaluate some of the policies currently being proposed by politicians in response to these emerging technologies. If you like what you hear, subscribe to our podcast channel, IEA Conversations. Most of the headlines that we see today regarding robots, AI, automation, they tend to be quite pessimistic and sometimes I would argue even hysterical. So you get everything from, is my job at risk of automation, to will killer robots take over the planet? Are we looking at advances in AI and robotics, etc., in the wrong way? I think we are, because uh, new technologies are what boosts our living standards and raise our quality of life over time. New jobs have been created faster then old jobs are lost. And my argument is that this is still going on. And and what we're seeing at the moment is the creation of a lot of new jobs. In the UK, we're stripping ahead of job losses through technology. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm not a pessimist. People definitely view the coming of this next industrial revolution in quite a different way, even though obviously history tells us that there have been great advances in technology that have themselves led to further job growth. But for one reason or another, the narrative seems very much to be that this will lead to huge job losses. What do you think is different about this one that makes people so certain that you know it's going to have these negative effects on the job market? I think most people think of the past as a time when unskilled jobs were lost. And it's clear that uh, artificial intelligence, algorithms, robots will actually threaten some existing professional roles, uh, roles of people who are currently highly paid and so on. And that probably makes a difference. Which particular professions then would you say fit into this, the sort of white collar jobs that are at risk? Well, it looks like lawyers, for example, certain types of of medics, certain medical roles may be taken over by AI and and, and, and other things. The professions, as I've I've, I've said before, are in many ways a kind of closed shop and they're they're kind of inward looking and they they look at traditional professional standards and so forth. Many of these things are, are beginning to disappear. The advent of blockchain technologies, for example, is raising questions about the role of people who currently certify transactions of various kinds, solicitors, that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think there are changes certainly coming for, for many professional people. A lot of these fears, certainly in the, in the media and in public policy, are leading to calls for more regulation, taxes on robots and AI and other labour-saving devices. Are they justified? I think a lot of the the policy initiatives are are driven by a completely different agenda. There are political issues which are being pushed, the Greens, for example, pushing the universal basic income, the Labour Party, uh, universal basic services being talked about and so forth. And these are old ideas in a way which kind of jumped on the bandwagon of, of contemporary concern about job loss. I think there are many policy things we could do before we need to think about a universal basic income. For example, we could we could switch the basis of taxation away from national insurance and income tax, which are essentially payroll taxes in a way, which discourage people from being employed. We could switch to taxes based, say, on environmental dysfunction or land value tax. We could expand the, the system of tax credits, for example, so that people wouldn't need to earn very much necessarily in work but if their circumstances were poor their income could be raised unlike the the universal basic income which of course gives whatever fantasy sum you dream up to everybody from millionaires to people uh, who are uh, are destitute i mean it's a very old idea it's been around for a long time in order to operate it it will be extraordinarily expensive Ed Miliband, for example, has spoken of a basic income of £10,000 a year. It doesn't spell out just who gets this, but uh, if we think that that certainly adults get it and children get a a proportionate 
ratio of this, then it's going to cost something the order of 580 billion. At the moment, we only spend about 250 billion on welfare benefits of all kind, including the state pension. But even at £10,000 a person, it wouldn't be enough for, for people who are currently on a, a very large range of benefits. For, for example, pensioners who are, get housing benefit. The amount the state currently gives them is well above £10,000. So you're going to have to compensate them for that. So the cost of this is absolutely enormous. It would imply very high marginal rates of tax. Also, we don't really know what the behavioural consequences of this would be, whether, whether people would tolerate a system where they were working hard, but other people were, were doing absolutely nothing at all. I think that's very unlikely we, but also, we could what move about, in that direction. That, that's a very good point. But also, what about the people who would like to work, but let's imagine there have been these widespread job losses, there simply aren't jobs for them to do. I think that would create a great deal of resentment too a desire for some kind of redistribution because otherwise you're left with a hugely stratified society and, and you know it, instead of the haves and haves nots it's the kind of works and do not works this is a hypothesis uh, as i say I, I don't think there's really very much prospect of this certainly not in my lifetime but probably in the lifetimes of most people listening to this the jobs of the future are not going to be jobs which uh, robots can do. They're going to be other types of jobs. They're going to be creative jobs. The Royal Society of Arts, which I've had my differences with over some of these issues, they think about the future of, of liberating, you know, creative abilities in the population. And I'm with that, really. In some ways, it might be that we are taking people at their word too much when they express fears in technical change. And also forgetting that even at the time of some of the great technical changes of history, there were still people who were arguing against them. In your paper, you mentioned David Ricardo warning about the job losses from machinery. So in many ways, there's nothing new about this. No, indeed. Uh, I've been looking at the uh, 1841 census, for example, uh, which time about 20% of the workforce were engaged in agriculture, another 20% engaged in domestic service. And a very large number of people employed in what I call the horse economy, you know, making coaches, uh, saddles, run, running, running stages and this kind of thing. And of course, major technical changes were just around the corner. In 1841, there were 3,000 people employed on the railways, which were only just beginning. But within 20 or 30 years, hundreds of thousands of people were employed on the railways. You know, if you were in 1841, you might be worried about job loss. But, you know, the future brings new things all the time. On that point, one of the reasons for this feeling of inevitability that advances in AI and so on will lead to job losses now could also be that people believe that the robots themselves will be able to do the jobs. They will become self-creating and therefore the jobs created will be highly technical. Many of the new jobs which are being created are nothing to do with technology at all. Uh, you know, there have been very considerable growth in, in recent years in care jobs, for example, in jobs in the entertainment field, in leisure activities of one kind or other, big boom in personal trainers, for example, or tattooists and, and, and people like this. So, you know, what happens when we get productivity increases is that prices tend to fall and this frees up spending power, which goes in other directions. And we know that there is a very high income elasticity of demand for service activities of various kinds, which, which robots, machines, things aren't going to uh, be able to fulfil. I say I'm very optimistic about, about the future for people. I think they're going to have to do different jobs. I've seen one quotation which says that the jobs which 60% uh, of today's students are, uh, will do in the future don't exist yet. And I think that's a very exciting prospect that there's new things coming along rather than you know a world in which we all expect to do similar jobs to what our, our parents did or their grandparents did or whatever. Let's look on yeah. the bright side on these things. And also that... that central planners and the, the public policy makers of today possibly aren't the best people to be making decisions that could impact those trends in the long run? No, the record of what used to be called manpower planning is absolutely diabolical. I mean, the attempts to forecast future demand uh, is, is a loser's game. It can't be done. You mentioned care jobs, actually. That's one area where I've heard a lot about the potential for AI to, to add to this and to become companions for people and deal with loneliness and, the, and these sorts of issues. Do you think that people will always want to have a human face when it comes to a caring role? 
I, I do think people will need a, a caring face. But robotics can be very, very helpful for keeping an eye on people, for checking in with, with every day to see that people are all right and so forth. And of course, already older people are finding it very much easier to communicate with, with their children, their grandchildren via Skype and things like this. The future is for older people is one where, yes, a new technology is going to help them, but it's not going to replace individuals. I mean, people who think that a little robot or something is going to say hello to you and cheer you up, uh, I think I've been reading too much science fiction. I completely agree. And also, we might be trying to view AI and, and robotics in the wrong way, kind of as p- potential replacement humans rather than aids to humans, if that makes sense. Well, that's right. I think these new technologies will very often be complementary to the things which people want to do rather than substitutes for them. The fundamental problems with with this scare literature on job loss is that it's, it's technological determinism. It's that machines, artificial intelligence, they are just going to drive their way through the economy. It doesn't work like this at all. For a start, the fact that a job could in principle be automated is a long way from actually automating that job. Robots or whatever have to be designed in such a way that they can cope with a whole range of problems. I mean, the example I often quote is being a plumber. It's essentially a mechanical job. You're joining up pipes. You know, a robot could, in principle, do this. But the reality is that plumbers have to work in very difficult conditions without full information in in often very idiosyncratic circumstances. Something has leaked under the stairs or, you know, a a pipe has come out somewhere and, and nobody quite knows where it is behind the skirting board and that kind of thing. Robots, which are very good for dealing with repetitive tasks and where they've got big data and lots of numbers and and, and know what to do yeah they can do it but the the idea of a a fully autonomous robot plumber is centuries away I think I just don't think it's a plausible thing and there are lots of jobs like that which require people yes to have mechanical skills but also to have you know the ability to improvise and to to make things up and and to deal with new problems that's something which i think humans do have a comparative advantage in yes and even if they could in theory create some prototype of a plumbing robot that could fulfill those tasks the key word with these kinds of innovation is often how cheap it is and how affordable it doesn't matter if if one test pilot in silicon valley can do it if it's not cheap enough to be widely available i think that's right and apart from the financial economic aspects of this, there are also the, the, the questions of the regulatory and social acceptance of these. And, and we've seen with new technologies that there is often a considerable backlash against them. Uh, Uber, uh, we've talked about on, on here before, I think, is a case where here you've got a what is actually a superior technology, everybody agrees, but it's been greatly resisted by, by interested parties. Fracking is another area where we know we've got the potential of cheap energy, but people don't want it in their backyard and they resist these things. So people listening will be aware of if they live south of the river is the, the, the problems on the trains. Should we replace guards by, by driver operated doors? And the answer seems to be from the unions, no, we shouldn't. So there's opposition of that kind, but there are also, I think, important regulatory issues. Uh, For example, computing, artificial intelligence, etc., could in principle handle company accounts, but who takes the responsibility for this being correct? At the moment, somebody legally has to sign these things off. A person has to know what's going on. And one of the problems, of course, is that humans don't always know what artificial intelligence is doing. We don't know the processes by which a conclusion is reached. And if we don't know that, you know, what authority can we give to accountancy or whatever it may be? And this throws up other questions too about to give ethical accountability to artificial intelligence. It would presumably have to meet some kind of higher standard than the average and then potentially be responsible for other forms of AI. There's a kind of philosophical and ethical debate that needs to take place here as well. Uh, Sure there is. This is not just a question for economists or technologists or number crunchers. It's a question which everybody needs to think about, I think. Thank you. For more blogs, podcasts, films and reports, visit our website at iea.org.uk.